and yes, to, to wrap us up today um, is the, the only speaker I haven't had the pleasure of meeting and working with. Um, but Haley, uh, I have heard a lot about her, and I know she's one of the uh, poster children of, of Go Farm, um, going on to create a very impactful and productive uh, small farm uh, on Oahu. And I think it's great, again, you know, how Daniela set us up um, in terms of why do people grow food? Because, you know, I was just reading um, uh, Haley's bio she has on her farm, Ahiki Acres, you know, and, and is talking, right, about um, reflecting on where she could make the biggest impact and how she could contribute, right? And even though she's gone off and gotten her degree in chemical engineering, right, coming back, this was a, a value-laden decision that she made in order to, to have direct and meaningful impact uh, on her community um, and obviously herself too. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just a really inspirational story. Um, I really appreciated just uh, quickly trying to learn about you, Haley. Um, and really looking forward to what you have to share with us today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Noah. And yeah, thank you guys for having me. Um, my name is Haley Mioka and my farm is Ahiki Acres. I'm gonna pull up a slideshow. Okay, is that working? Yes, cool. Okay, um, aloha kako. Um, I am a graduate of the Go Farm program. Uh, I did the program at in Waimanalo. I was born and raised in Waimanalo and I'm currently also living in Waimanalo. Um, I, like Noah said, I, you know, went away to college. I never thought I'd come home. You know, my mom was like, you know, telling me like, oh, come home one day. I'm like, oh, I'm never coming home. I'm going to go make a difference, you know, somewhere else. I want to go do big things. Um, senior year of college, I took a food politics class and it changed everything because I, I was already obsessed with food and sustainability, um, but I never thought it was a a viable career path. Um, but just, you know, after learning more, getting more involved in, I was in Rochester and upstate New York, getting more involved in the community. I just became really passionate. And I thought if I really want to make a difference, like where can I go and where else better than Waimanalo, um, where I was born and raised and where there is even one of the highest rates of food insecurity in Hawaii. And so I came home to do the program. I kind of just banked my whole life on that. I had no prior experience farming. And in the program, I met my partner. Um, well, we actually first started dating and then kind of crazily decided to start a business together after one month of dating, um, Matthew McKinnon. And we've been running our business since the end of 2019. So this is an aerial view of our current plot at the Waimanalo Research Station at the Go Farm Incubator site. We started with a quarter acre and rapidly scaled to 1.25 acres. Um, what you can see here is actually a half an acre of veggie production. And for about a year and a half, we had three quarters of an acre in turmeric, which we did as a contract grow with another farmer in Waimanalo, kind of as an experimental um, project to see what it was like to do a contract grow. Um, and oh, I, oh, I'll just say it now. So um, I'm going to come up with this later, but like we recently got a 20 year lease for a five acre plot in Waimanalo um, leasing from the Department of Ag. And so that's where we are moving our farm to currently. So our main crops are fast yielding and nutrient dense vegetables. Uh, mainly because at the Go Farm incubator site, you only have up to three years. Um, so we didn't have a chance to plant longer term trees um, or other crops. Uh, currently, our, our most popular crop is salad mix. Specifically, we um, help adults ages 30 to 50 who live in Ko'olau Poco to access local organic produce. And to expand our reach, we also supply chefs who um, support the local economy and care about the environment. Uh, 
I started Ahiki Acres to address growing problems around food security and to be a model for young new farmers in Hawaii. Um, this is our logo, and it's a picture of the third Olomana Peak, which is named Ahiki. There's also an old Mo'olelo that talks about Ahiki being known as a beloved ruler over Kailu and Wamanala, which is fitting because not only representing our location, our name symbolizes our dedication uh, to our community. At 27 years old, I'm proving that a farming career can be profitable and sustainable for young Native Hawaiians. Currently, my partner and I both make living wages while employing one full-time employee and remaining profitable throughout. Our farm makes the case that small-scale farming can be an attractive career option for young people who are interested in growing food for their community. And we hope that we can set the example and encourage more to take on this critical work. And so many of you are probably wondering, like, how are you guys doing this? How is this possible? So I'm going to talk about ways that we're able to have a successful, sustainable small farm. So one of the major things I think um, is attributed to our success is that we are always innovating and increasing our efficiencies on the farm. Um, as you can see in this photo, this is actually Matt in both of the photos. Um, we have invested in, while these tools may be a little bit more expensive, they increase our productivity, like this five row cedar. Um, not pictured, we also use a paper pot transplanter, which speeds up our transplanting from an hour to five minutes. And so while these are like larger investments um, up front, they have increased our efficiencies and have allowed us to produce more food um, with such a small area of growing space. Um, this other picture shown here with the tomatoes is a trellising system called Clipper and it allows us to grow tomatoes. It's kind of hard to see, but we can like lower and lean the tomatoes so that they continue to can continue to grow. And theoretically they could like keep growing for a year or more. Um, I think our longest crop of like one tomato plant was over six months, but we usually get hit by like a disease or something before then. Um, especially because the greenhouse that we built is not covered with plastic. And we found out like rain is like a huge factor in like messing up our crops. So that's just something we learned um, along the line. Um, another thing that we do is we're always learning and experimenting. So we've done many like master classes online, um, leadership classes, the Kuhana business class. Um, I've done the organic seed production course with the Organic Seed Alliance. Um, so I'm also into seed saving. Here's a picture of Matt testing the bricks or like the sugar content of a tomato. Um, I didn't realize until Dr. Crow like did her presentation, but I'm pretty sure she has the Crow Lab and we did like a soil health um, cohort. And so we're always trying to do things to increase our knowledge um, on the farm. And yeah, I think that that's a huge help to our success. We're also always applying for grant opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of farmers would say they don't have enough time to do that. And it is kind of an arduous task, um, but dedicating the time really does pay off. Um, I am also grateful to be a graduate of Go Farm because we do have them as a uh, resource and they've been really helpful in helping us when we do apply for grants. Um, this is kind of something that I've been struggling with, but caring for our bodies and physical and mental sustainability is also really important. Um, for me, I do yoga as my way of trying to keep my body strong. Um, my partner, Matt, is pictured here with, he just started using a back brace and we got these seeds to these butt seeds so that when we're in the field, we can like harvest and do things more ergonomically. Um, and then we're trying to take more rest to avoid burnout, especially because I'm still young and I don't, or I want to keep farming for the rest of my life. So I, I don't want to get hurt and, or get burnt out from working too much. Calculating cost of production is another huge thing. And I've found talking to a lot of farmers, people, a lot of farmers don't do this. 
again, I think it's the same as grant opportunities. It's it's an arduous task. And, you know, we're always in the field. There's no time to be doing these other calculations. Um, but thanks to a um, ORC and D uh, class, I was connected with this new um, Neuer cost to grow this app. And in this graph here is actually just an example. We did a analysis of our beans. And I don't know if many of you guys know, but beans are really hard to make a profit off of because the labor to harvest beans um, is really high. Like in this graph, you can see the big orange chunk is, that's all of like the most of the cost is attributed to picking beans. Um, and so doing these cost of production studies have been super helpful um, because we found out, for example, at our small scale, growing broccoli and cabbage aren't profitable for us, even though at the farmer's market, everyone's like, oh, why don't you guys have broccoli? Why don't you guys have cabbage, onions? Um, like I said, with beans too, they're actually like our second most popular item at the farmer's market. And I've kind of called them our Costco chicken because we break even on them. So we're not losing money, but it also draws in customers and, you know, maybe they just see the beans, but if they come into our booth, then they'll see something else like, oh, I want their beans, but like that beet also looks good. So let me try that. Um, so we have um, diverse revenue streams, but 70% of our total sales are direct to consumer at the Kylo Town Farmers Market. Uh, we also started an online marketplace during COVID and we've kept it um, for customers to pre-order, especially since items sell out quick or if people don't wanna have to worry about getting up early and getting to the market right at eight o'clock, they can pre-order. Currently 30% of those market sales are online. Um, and then the remaining 30% of our total sales are to local restaurants or wholesale wholesalers, including those pictured here. So currently our demand is greater than our supply. And to fill the gap, we've aggregated from other local farmers. Currently, this accounts for about 25% of our total income. And we try to aggregate fruits and vegetables from fellow farmers who practice similarly with our values. So either organically, regeneratively. Um, and I like to say it's kind of an afterthought, but the acres in our name um, helps to symbolize our cooperative effort. Um, because you know, well, currently our ha we just have half an acre, which is not even a full acre, um, but we are acres because we are helping all these other farmers. Um, and so currently we are having the farmers, the farmers are getting 80% of every sale and we make 20 and that just helps cover um, like the work that we do into aggregating everything, organizing everything. Um, for many farmers, like, Saleh said, renting a booth at the farmer's market is not feasible. Um, there's the booth cost, the time, six hours out of your day you could be used for farming. And the fact that you might not have a lot to sell. So like we used to sell watercress for a farmer who only sold watercress. And if he only brought watercress to the market, it would be hard for him to justify spending that time and that cost for him. So Actually, more food attracts more customers to our booth, too. So it's a win-win situation. And I'm over time, but quickly, these are just our biggest challenges and solutions. And I think we've talked about them all. Um, but yeah, I'll just end here and if anyone has questions later on. Thank you. Awesome. Mahalo, Haley. It's a great way, I think, to end it, taking it back to um you know really the the essential element right there's no local food without without the food and without the production um and so really nice to have that um perspective to to round off our panel today um and so yeah we are a little over but um we do still have time for questions